Welcome to Redressing Histories, a podcast. This series seeks to foreground the work of African diaspora researchers whose work and histories are continually underrepresented and often overlooked within publications, academia, museums and the media. This podcast has been sponsored by the University of Brighton Centre for Design History and the University's Equality and Inclusion Fund. My name is Ellie Michaela Young, and today I will be speaking to Lorna Hamilton Brown, who is an independent researcher whose interests lay in questioning the lack of visibility of black crafters and documenting their hidden histories. In her practice, she combines her skills as an artist, researcher, educator, knitwear designer, performer, and video maker. In 2004, she was awarded an MBE for services to the community and she's a patron of the Knitting and Crochet Guild and a member of Vogue's Knitting Diversity Advisory Council. Lorna's work, if anybody wants to see it, is currently being exhibited as part of an exhibition called We Gather at the Craft Council Gallery in Islington. Welcome, Lorna. Thank you for joining me today. And I'm looking forward to having this conversation with you. Lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I wanted to introduce you by sort of you telling everybody that's listening about your research and your practice. Right. So I'm a UK based artist in Hastings, which is in East Sussex by the sea. I love to be by the sea. And my research came out of my dissertation that I did at the Royal College of Art. And it was about the myth that black people don't knit. So somebody at an academic conference in the loop in 2013 said to me, oh, I didn't know black people knit. And I was just like, why would you even say that? So my dissertation was to interrogate that statement. And from doing that, I saw that it was really important that you use oral history and art to document the experiences of black knitters because not not much has been written down. And since doing my seminal dissertation, which has been used by a lot of people because there's so little written, I've Mm. continued my research, but I'm not linked to any organisation. I'm just an independent researcher now. Okay. So obviously as an independent researcher, there's um, difficulties you're going to encounter anyway. Well, finances, access to books and that type of material yeah. but um you you mentioned that obviously there's not much written about African diaspora knitters or even crafters more generally I would assume yeah so how does that affect the research that you're trying to undertake do you have to change it or do you have to shift your position to actually write in an academic way no I don't have to sh- shift my position in, in a sense it's I'm still writing the history of knitting but there's gaps so I'm looking at the history of knitting and so for example if you read a book on the history of knitting it will say the early examples of knitting were found in Egypt and North Africa so that needs to be interrogated but then it jumps onto Europe and then most of the histories that have been written start within Europe so I'm going back to North Africa I'm looking at Morocco and places Mm -hmm. like that and the Caribbean, I'm um, starting looking in my family, what knitting did they do there? What were their practices? Mm-hmm. So, so I don't have to take a different stance in that way. I'm filling gaps and I'm looking at the gaps. So in some respects, the gaps are very helpful. Okay. Okay. Because that it, it is, so they're helpful in that you know where to aim and you won't know where to target but isn't it made more difficult because there's no additional literature or is it better because there's no literature that has tainted this history that you're trying to uncover um I think it's more difficult because there is nothing written and then the people that have written the histories can sort of say well how do you know that why are you looking at that there is Mm. nothing so a lot of the time I just get told there is nothing but that's not the truth. When you start looking at the archives, you can find bits in newspapers and magazines. And so I think you're always fighting maybe the establishment who I suppose that they, I suppose in a way they want to say if it was there, we would have written about it. But we know that from their gaze, they wouldn't have written about it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Because they, 
they wouldn't necessarily be thinking what was happening in the Caribbean or Africa. They looked more to where they were doing the knitting. Mm. But so, that's also because they there's an there was an assumption, isn't it, that there was no places like Africa and the Caribbean didn't have culture or histories or civilizations. So exactly, everything must start with Europe. Yeah, and also, well, well, the thing is, you know, it's in the VNA, um, in their collection, they can clearly see that the early examples are from Egypt and North Africa. So there's no, there's no debate. It is there. But they're not held, I feel, they're not held in high regard. So, you know, when they think of, like, what was happening in Scandinavia, what was happening in Shetland, it's held to high... You know, nobody's saying, oh, let's look for those Moroccan knitting patterns. It's like, Mm -hmm. let's look at Shetland. So it's always that those things are valued more highly. And Mm -hmm. I think from doing my research, things people would say is like, well, they're never knitted because, you know, they come from hot countries. And it's like, if you look at the continent in Africa, it's not all hot there everywhere mm. and it's cold. Mm. And and just those, you know, generalisations mm-hmm. of just saying, yeah, they, they wouldn't, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. So I, I think, yeah, the gaps are a good thing, but it's also, and then people think, well, why why do you want to do that? There's already, it's already been written about. And it's like, well, I want to see my culture mm-hmm. and what was happening, you know? Mm-hmm. I want to know what's mm-hmm. happening. So... Like when I was talking to my mother and I said, how, how did you knit? And she was saying she used coconut bone. And I was like, what is that? So she said, you know, the middle of the coconut leaf. They would knit with that. Okay. And then I was asking her, oh, was that fragile? She said, yeah, it would break. So they would treat it with beeswax. So these are all really important things mm. that have never been documented. But to my mom, that's not important. That's just mm. like everybody mm. knows that. So mm. it's getting all these things documented and written down. Yeah, and yeah. I think in isolation, other people will think, well, it's not really important. That's just a small detail, but it's collectively when we join all these dots together. Mm. And the thing that I um, generally have to do is I have to relate it back to what was happening in Europe. So my mum said they would knit with bicycle spokes. And I knew that in Victorian times, mm-hmm. they would knit with bicycle spokes. So I would say, mm-hmm. and, you know, the commonality. So I find that maybe I have to do that more than if I was, yeah, I have to do that more than if I was writing about European knitting. So, you know, I would say mm-hmm. like, oh, this was happening. And I suppose to give it some validity as well, this was happening in Victorian Britain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh, that's so fascinating. You know, so, of, of itself, it wouldn't, I don't think it would be held, held as... As important if it was... As important, yeah. 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 Mm. I was going to jump in, right, because, so my mum's Austrian, right? And yeah. they, she taught me how to knit. And it's very different to the way the British knit. Yeah. So is there similar? Do the do, do you and your family knit in the same way the British do, or uh, differences in the technique and style? Well, definitely style, but technique. Yeah. Well, um, a lot of the time they were taught by missionaries, so it can be what I found like in the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. It is the very English way of knitting. Okay. From, but you know, I need to do a lot more research because mm. it can vary from island to island, you know. Okay. Um, and it's like there's a Portuguese style of knitting, mm-hmm. and I I hate when people say it's Portuguese knitting because it's a style of knitting which mm-hmm. was done in um, North Africa and other countries, but okay. somebody just came up with a term and called it Portuguese knitting, and that, that happens a lot where things are helping happening elsewhere mm-hmm. you get called something unless you really do your research you just think that's mm-hmm. what it is okay and and actually that style that if it was transported from north america to north africa to portugal or wherever from the african continent continent the portuguese had colonized then they would have also taken that back to the caribbean and the islands yeah. that the portuguese colonized so then again yeah. Again, that's um, that style would have then manifested in the yeah. Caribbean, which makes the different islands diff- knit in different yeah. styles. That, that's right. I think as well, um, it's also, I think, sort of like with colonisation and how our agency is seen. So in the books that I've researched, and I've mm-hmm. researched most of the ones um, written about the history of knitting, when black people are depicted they're shown as just beginning to knit. 
So we're not shown as having agency or having any tradition of knitting. Mm. So it's almost like you're having to convince people that actually we can be competent knitters. It's almost like a mm. surprise to them that we can do okay. complex complex patterns and complex things. So mm. it's a whole kind of like a disregard that we would be able to do these things. And so like when I was speaking to my mum, she goes, oh, we knit lace tablecloths and all these kind of things. Mm. So it's also documenting the skills, but I think you're always fighting against, yeah, we actually do have these skills, mm. you know, and that we, you know, maybe it was taken there by missionaries, but we also um, adapted what we learned and did our yeah. own things and have yeah. our own traditions. I think that's why um, Rose Sinclair's work is so important. Definitely. Because she's documented a lot of that history. So at least Definitely. we're going to have a text that says now that actually this is what people were doing and it's going to make things not necessarily easier, but at least have be less of a battle for you to constantly say, yeah, we do knit and, and yeah. it is important. And it's def- definitely because, you know, I did contact Rose when I was doing my dissertation. She was really helpful. She was just saying, you know, there's so little written and it's good mm-hmm. when you've got somebody else who, has written something and the research and that we don't have to reinvent the, the wheel. We can mm. places to go and look for further research is really important. And I think, you know, because she's a lecturer at Goldsmiths as well, there's a certain gravitas to her research mm. as well. I know you're, you're an independent researcher, but yeah. we've talked about this before, right? That one of the difficulties with you trying to find somewhere to do a PhD I don't know do you want to have that conversation so people understand why actually there's there's difficulties as well not only with not being able to find work but also having to jump hurdles and the barriers that are faced by African diaspora researchers when they're trying to do this research in Haiti so do you want to tell us about your attempts to do a PhD journey I, I, I will talk about that because most researchers, you know, they're doing their research as part of their PhD. And then it gives you time to go to conferences and to speak and to have mm-hmm. access to the library. So mm-hmm. when I'd finished doing my um, my MA at the Royal College of Art, which I got distinction for, you know, they don't give out many distinctions. I was like, wow, I want to do a PhD. I want to continue this research. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, not really knowing what a PhD was. So I did approach the head of research at that institution and I knew that I would need two supervisors. So one um, to do with knit and one to do Mm. with black history or something. And I was just told we can't do the black thing. And I was just like, well, you know, and there's just, you know, she just said to me, you know, maybe it's not the best place. This is not the best place for you to to study. And it was just very dismissive. Mm. And I was just like, wow, you know, and not any support. And then also, knowing that I couldn't afford to do like an independent PhD. I wanted a funded place, so not given any information. So I left feeling very disheartened and upset. And then I checked all my emails about that I've ever had about PhDs because we never had any careers advice, you know, saying, mm-hmm. well, you've done your master's now. Those of you who want to go and do a PhD, this is what you do. We never had that. And I found that there was going to be a session the next day and so I thought I'd go along. And then that was by the same person I'd seen the day before. So it's like that sense, why are people holding on to this information? Why aren't mm. they giving us the information? Mm. Um, so that's the barriers that I felt. And I just felt that I just, even if there was a way, I just didn't want to study at that institution. And when I spoke mm. to other people, who I just thought it might be me. And I spoke to other black students, a similar experience, not just mm. at RCA, across the board, where the, especially the funded places seem mm-hmm. to, they seem to, there's a barrier for you getting them, basically. Mm. I mean, it's it's about that thing, is it? It's finding the right supervisors. Yeah. There isn't that many that do the research that you do or know about the stuff that you know about. And then obviously funding, again, like you say, that's, that's a barrier. Yeah, and I think, you know, the thing is, I don't expect them to know anything, but... I, you want them to be supportive and say, well, yeah. okay, maybe we're not the best place. Let's look at where you could go to. Let's yeah. Yeah. let's have a look. But, you know, to be just dismissed. But I have to say that I did reach out to Brighton University and they were really helpful. Mm-hmm. But it was a very sort of um, 
short time frame to apply for a funded place. And so I left it, but that kind of restored my faith. But the thing is also when I was looking at doing the funded PhD, because the PhDs are in groups. So it wasn't just, even though I was done at the RCA, there was other universities in that group and you could have a supervisor across the group. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I was just thinking, how can you tell me you can't do the black thing? You can't do it here, but within yeah. this group of organisations, mm. they can do it, you know, do, so. So do you think the RCA took that approach because that was one person's view or it's like an institutional thing with the RCA because historically it is connected to British history of empire and colonisation and so that is, that has just continued as a thread throughout the institution? I think it's a thread that goes through the institution from my experience of being there. Mm. Um, so I can, I can only talk about my experience. So like when I was writing my dissertation, you know, I was saying to them that I don't only want to have black references. I want to be exposed to different things. And at mm. the time, people were trying to decolonize the reading list and there was so much mm. opposition to that. So mm. I'm hoping that things have changed now. You know, yeah. but that was my experience. Yeah, I mean, I think I think as a researcher, it's hard because I mean, my my supervisors um, when I first started my PhD, both were fashion historians or dress historians, mm. but didn't know anything about race and stuff like that. But then at the same time, they did make an effort to try and understand, to try and learn. But they also gave me the space to try and figure things out myself. So there was yeah. so there's a benefit to them not being experts in your area because they then can't control yeah what you're writing because a lot of supervisors tend to do that don't they tell you this is what you should be writing about and this is wrong yeah. and blah 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 so so there's there's also benefits to people not knowing what you're writing about yeah yeah no and I see you know I, I see now so many more black independent researchers so that it makes mm-hmm. you wonder why I mean not that it's bad to be independent but I think there's similar people that haven't for whatever reason, been able to access a funded PhD, you mm. know, and to have just gone their own route and just think, well, I'll create my own table mm. and do my own mm. thing. And that's what I'm doing. Yeah, I, I mean, there are difficulties being an independent researcher, aren't there? Because, like, funding specifically is one of those things. So are you a, a full-time independent researcher or are you part-time researcher, part-time artist, part-time teacher, part-time everything just to make ends meet? like part-time because um you know my art is my main thing but a lot of the research that I do is linked into Mm. my practice because my practice is knit and textiles and I'm researching textiles so the two things go hand in hand Mm. but um yeah it's difficult because like when you get invited like I got invited to present a paper but then I don't have time to do all this unpaid research Mm. whereas Mm. other people that are institutions they can just fit it into their phd or other things mm. like that mm. um so it's that the the main thing that i find is like getting access to articles because they're behind the paywall and when yeah. you're at a, a university then you can access these things for free so i have to like say oh could you just get me a copy of this article and then sometimes they can't get it but you don't really mm. want to keep bothering people so that's really mm. that's the biggest thing is like getting access to journals and things like that I want to talk about We Gather, your current exhibition. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Right, so We Gather is an exhibition that came about from the research that Dr Karen Patel, who's in at Birmingham University, carried out, and she's still carrying out. So her research looks at the inequalities and racism in craft. And I have been a part of that conversation, calling out the Crafts Council after the death of George Floyd. And we've been having these conversations. So I got commissioned mm-hmm. to make a piece that would speak to that conversation. So um, I made a knitted magazine cover, which is called We Make. So Patois colloquial for We Make. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so that it could ad- address those issues. So there's five other artists um, of um, Black and Asian heritage um, in the okay. exhibition and five women. And they're all responding to that. But because the space was so big, we've been able to add other work in. So from initially only doing the one commission piece, Mm -hmm. we've been able to put a body of work in. 
So um, I've got other pieces in there. So I've got a um, piece called Out of the Blue, which is my response to the London riots. Okay. And it's two um, life-size knitted pieces of black youth. And what that piece is about is it's just about youth because I felt that youth got demonised mm-hmm. when the riots happened. And so it's just like, what are they doing? And when I've taken the piece in school, you know, kids go, oh, miss, he's got a gun, he's doing a drug deal. They're doing nothing, they're just standing, you know. And it's also to subvert people's idea of what Nick can be and that Nick mm-hmm. can be used for different subjects. So there's the magazine cover itself. And on the magazine cover, one of the articles is about Siva lace, which is what I'm doing research about. So this particular lace, which is from Brazil, I was doing mm-hmm. research about crochet. So I was doing crochet, 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 looking through this book. And then I just saw this clip and it said about this Siva lace and it said made by Negroes and is of no merit whatsoever and I was just like how could somebody write that so I'm currently doing research you know trying to find examples of this lace and to find why would somebody say that you know and very interesting interestingly enough so that was in the history of handmade lace Uh, it was 1903 some around that period Mm. but then I found another book which is the history of lace and then that author says that this lace made by blacks is the finest example you can find. So it's very interesting. So it's mm. like written at the same time. So one refers to, you know, geography term, Negroes. The other one, blacks. Mm. And so uh, I want to look at that. But I know that during slavery times, there were laws that um, slaves couldn't wear fine materials or use fine materials so mm-hmm. that would have been a hindrance anyway they wouldn't be able to mm. use lace or anything like that so that's where my art and my research go hand in hand so I'm researching that so the other pieces I've got in is a piece called I Don't See Colour which is a crochet piece in white and then mm-hmm. um, embroidered on is the word black so that's kind of that thing that I feel that sometimes they don't see it's your closeness to whiteness that people appreciate but when you Mm. try to really be black it's like oh you know they say like not like those other black people Mm. you know Mm. so Mm. there's that and then the last piece which was commissioned by a friend of mine Felix Ford um is called Woman Blue Elevate and that's based on the piece of music called Woman Blue it's a blues song and it's also known as I Know You Rider and some um I can't remember his name it was um, uh, John Lomax. John and Aunt Alex Lomax. They collected lots of folk songs and blues songs. So they heard this eighteen-year-old mm-hmm. black girl sing one stanza of this song in a prison. She was in prison for murder, mm-hmm. and they just liked the song. Then they added lots of verses to it, and it became a whole new song. And I thought, and so my friend was very um, interested in all these songs because there's a mill up. I don't know if it's Yorkshire, up north anyway. So John Arben Mill, he brought out a range of yarn called Yarn Adelic. So each one of the, each yarn is for a different song. So one is Woman Blue. Mm-hmm. And my friend, she's a knitwear designer, but she's also into sound and her friend Muriel, they made um, punch cards for these music box. So each one of those songs, they've made um, a punch card. So she's mm-hmm. going, oh, knit, knitting machines use punch card. Could you respond to this song using the punch card. So I've knitted one square, um, which was a response to the song. And then it's got cables in it because I'm looking at how the song has changed. And then after I did that piece, I thought, but the black girl's been lost. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to do another piece. I am knitting another square, which is in invisible thread with one strand of lyrics. So it's very see-through and it's above, it's hung above the other piece. And it's to say, I'm elevating her voice. And then what I did as well was I wrote out that one verse that she did. And mm-hmm. then for each letter, I um, assigned it to the alphabet till I got to 24. So X, Y, Z was, became one letter. And then I've used the, the letters from her voice to make the punch card to make the lace because I want to honour that black girl. And mm-hmm. so when you, when you look through that piece, I'll send you a picture, when you look through her work you see the other piece and it's like you we always reference her mm. and that uh, it's the erasure of black women from history because when he heard the black woman singing he didn't even ask her a name there's no acknowledgement or anything mm-hmm. and although she's in prison for murder you know I was thinking 
was it domestic violence you know 18 year olds so yeah mm. so those are the pieces that I've got in that exhibition at the moment that um well I know it's on from now till February when the end February it's, it's, it's at the craft council gallery in Islington and it's on from now to the 5th of February 2022 so get along and see it Okay, I am definitely going to go and see. Yeah, it. make sure you do. No, I am. I am. I already looked the other day about bookings, and I was going to book it, but then I had a few things on, so I'm trying to go on a time where I can actually spend a good amount of time just thinking about what you've produced, because I'm already intrigued by the crochet thing with the white crochet with the word black in it, because it, it's funny because my I would see that and I would automatically think that that's just being black in Britain, isn't it? Where we have to yeah, go into these yeah. spaces and we are the only black. Yeah, exactly. That's what came to mind. Yeah, that's that it. That's it. And then, and so my work always has a lot of historical references. So mm. in Victorian times, um, women would do this Tunisian crochet, very fine crochet, mm -hmm. instead of having the, the, the Ada that you do cross-stitch on, they would crochet it. So that's why okay. I've done that. And then I've, so it's a historical reference. And then I've done the cross-stitch in white on there so it's looking at and also I wanted a piece of crochet in there because crochet is always overlooked and I okay. think you know when the lady said black people don't niche goes they crochet though don't they and we're always associated with crochet mm. but not necessarily with knit so what do you think needs to be done to address the, ch the challenges that you've encountered and your experiences to make it a better space for future researchers? I think meeting you and then other people that are doing research and coming together and having the space mm -hmm. where we can talk together mm -hmm. is so, so important, like your podcast, because I think that, you know, in America, they have much more tradition of, there's much more people. They're used to mm -hmm. seeing, you know, the black professors and all that, but we don't see that so much here. Mm -hmm. So I think it's making space to have those conversations and be able to network together, share resources, because we don't need to reinvent the wheel. So if people are doing similar research, we can mm -hmm. look at their research. And, um, you know, we, I think we don't need to hold on to what we're doing because we're looking at the bigger picture, aren't we, that mm -hmm. we want to make it better for the people that are coming behind. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I guess supporting each other as well is really important because sometimes you just need you just need somebody to pat you on the back, hold yeah. you up when you just think I'm over all this. It's just too much. Yeah, because I think a lot of the time we're having to defend our work so more than I think than what students having to defend it, explain it. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to study that? I think a lot more is put on us. And so just to be in a space mm -hmm. where you don't have to do that extra layer mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. explaining and justifying and just be and celebrate, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember during um, the height of Black, um, George, when George Floyd died, was murdered and ha what a draining time that was. My friend mm -hmm. made a film on Black Joy and I think that's the thing. We need to celebrate mm -hmm. and have Black mm -hmm. Joy. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important. Yeah, that that is definitely true. Maybe, mm -hmm. I, uh, maybe we need to do something for us to gather more regularly and have these yeah. conversations because I think that George Floyd thing was just one of many mm. incidences that we get impacted on constantly yeah. and I don't think people recognize okay he was an American and that happened in America but yeah. he was also black and we know what our experiences are here so it yeah. does have a negative impact on us and I've 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 stopped now watching the, because I call it black trauma, where they yeah, put the yeah. videos of people being assaulted by the police and all mm. them sort of stuff, or even people just walking about their daily business and being mm. attacked. I mean, my niece sent me a message yesterday saying, you know, um, she was walking down the street and then, and then some guy called her some name and because she didn't respond to him, it was monkey this and monkey that yeah, and then yeah. they started making noises you know and it's like this is our daily experience yeah and that's it, it. And it's exhausting and I don't think people understand this concept now you've got them getting me off on one because I keep thinking more and more that people black people and people of colour in academia need a safe space a safe space Absolutely. where we can talk to each other engage with each other and provide the support that's missing in mainstream academia Absolutely, absolutely. Definitely needed, 100%. Yeah. And then I think also what would be nice is somewhere 
where you can go and access the research that black academics are doing mm. easily. Oh. Okay, okay. So you mean like that we should have some kind of database to know these are the African diaspora researchers or the researchers yeah. of colour and this is the work that they're doing. Yeah, because there's overlaps. You know, so somebody yeah, might yeah. be doing fashion or they might be doing food, but there's overlaps. And yeah, so I think that would be really helpful, you know, because, okay. you know, organisations go, well, we don't know anybody, you know, so I think in amongst ourselves, mm. there should be somewhere where you could go and mm. sort of know what other people are doing but I think yeah definitely black joy and you know just seeing what you're doing makes me happy you know and <laughs> when I saw you on the YouTube with Talika and stuff you know it's really good it's, it lifts your soul you know because it's so often and like when I'm saying from a British perspective because we're used to seeing that happen in America but we're not so mm. used to seeing you know British black academics I'm just like mm. yeah it's really good it's empowering it's our future. It's our future, Lorna. We're going to start doing more than that. We've just got to figure yeah. out how we're going to do it, where we're going to do it and how it's going to work. But it will. We're going to do something because I don't want um, people coming up behind me. I'm always encouraging my working yeah. class students and students of colour to do, go beyond a degree, maybe yeah. do a PhD. But it's trying to encourage somebody who may have been told that they are not the type of person I'm believed been told and seen and thought that mm. they're not the type of person that should mm. be doing a PhD so it's trying to for me it's a lot about encouraging these students yeah. to do something so yeah. then the, the pool gets bigger and bigger doesn't it yeah and I think the thing as well is like with academia uh, you know we have perceptions of when we go into it like who is a person that does a master who is a person that does a PhD what language and you don't have to use all that flowery language. You can mm-hmm. just be yourself. And then it's realising, oh, yeah. I could just be myself and I could just write yeah. as me. Exactly. Um, that is so releasing, you know, and empowering. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Because I think a lot of the times, because we've told for so long that our voices aren't valid mm. and what we say is not valid, so then we're always trying to find a way to write in this so-called correct academic way that it doesn't allow us to speak from a place of authenticity. And I think exactly. that's important. Exactly. And I think that's the that's the things that, you know, when we be able to gather together, we could just encourage one another, no, 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 you know, I've done my PhD. You just use your normal voice mm-hmm. because our voices are going to be different. Why are we trying to mimic yeah. somebody yeah, exactly. else's tone of voice, you know? Exactly. But exactly. I, I, know that, I know that depending on what institution you're at, there could be pressure on you to have a certain tone of voice but you have to be yourself well I I haven't I haven't heard that one and I'm Mm. like I I think when I first went started doing this PhD I thought oh dear god because everybody was talking proper in it and I'm like oh no I don't sound like any of these people and Mm. I was thinking but it's not even it's not even proper it's different so yeah exactly exactly it's not even proper it's just different because I like when I did my dissertation I was like saying to uh, because I'm dyslexic and I had um, Mm -hmm. a tutor that helped me and I was like oh I don't I'm not going to get a good mark because I haven't used loads of posh words and she was saying to me it's a skill to be able to distill a very complex thing into simple language Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. and so I was just really pleased when I got my decision I thought yeah I can just have my voice because I I'm making valid points I don't have to be all flowery and Mm -hmm. you know and, and even if I present I can present it in the way that I would present, you know, and drop in some jokes and some lyrics, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And have that freedom to do that. I like dropping in the lyrics pieces. Like <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, yeah. But. Right, so, so then I think as well, it's about us as well, um, not only coming together, but and being that network of support for each other, but also challenging what it means to be, academic literature what it means yeah. to write in that academic language because mm. I just I think a lot of that stuff they don't understand how exclusionary it is I sp- and even it doesn't even matter and I'm not saying that African diaspora or people of colour can't write in an academic way of course they can but then at the same time most of the time the people that they want to speak to I'm not in academia. Yeah. Because a lot of us are I, not interested in just talking to academics about academic yeah. nonsense. We want to yeah. reach a wider audience. But I think the thing is, is that it's not, I, I think it's not even that. It's that I think that academics 
a historic can have a certain way of talking which is elitist and maybe they use words that are not necessary to set themselves apart you know that I've studied whatever whatever right mm -hmm. and research should be for everybody shouldn't it so if you've done yeah. some research you want everybody to hear it so you should be able to speak to the masses and mm -hmm. I think some academics they can only speak to ac other academics yeah yeah completely agree but then mm. I suppose that's where I assume that's where they think the value is because if yeah. you're talking to other academics then their other academics will reference you and all that sort yeah. of stuff whereas yeah. I'm personally not interested in that I would rather yeah. like have somebody an ordinary person on the street reading what I'm writing than somebody making sure that I make fit within this particular framework of yeah. academia so that I can be published in a journal or something like that yeah and it's although that's what academia is about in it really yeah, journals but, or, but, and and books yeah I think the thing with the internet now things are changing and you know there's yeah. so much information mm -hmm. so it's like a lot of these journals they must be struggling for readership you know yeah, yeah so there's other ways you know and I think things like Instagram you know people are linking back to their website and publishing mm. their own articles and things like doing yeah. podcasts so there's many yeah. different ways no. Yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, I'm, I'm going to say thank you, Lorna, for um, joining me today. The next time we will be seeing you is on our panel discussion with the other ladies oh, yeah. that I've interviewed. So that would be Talika Kirkland, Kadian Gosler, and Miriam Hines Smith. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I can't wait. That's going to be amazing.